so very much. It's good to see choir in DOZ, amen? Amen, amen. You know, all around the world right now, there are people gathered on this particular weekend celebrating one of the biggest miracles, greatest miracles that we see in Scripture. It is, they're celebrating <clears throat> not the miracle of a, a bunny rabbit laying eggs, although that certainly would be a, a, a miracle. Um, ch ch chocolate eggs at that. Um, <laughs> But the miracle, the miracle that, that, that's being celebrated all over the world today is the fact that a dead man rose from the grave. But I want to talk to you a little bit today and what we are here to celebrate is, is a miracle that, that, that's even a little bit stronger than that. And that is that a God would decide to die. For stuff like us, I, 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 I it, it's, it's not as big a mystery to me that that God, man, could could raise himself up from the grave if he, that same God, could step out on palpable darkness, could speak to nothing and everything. He could certainly raise himself up from the dead. But to make the decision that he would come down here and endure that old rugged cross and despise the shame so that one day he could spend the ceaseless ages, listen to me, so that he could spend the ceaseless age of eternity with me. It is the scandal of grace. That, that, that's a miracle the unexplainable that's the undefinable that he would choose of his own free will to say I will lay down my life for each and every one of them hard headed knuckle headed stubborn messed up jacked up folk do it even for those who will never accept me I'll do it so that at least they have a chance that's the awesome awesomeness of the gospel of Jesus the Christ pray with me father it is one more time into the holiness and the solemnity of this moment that we would invite not only your presence but also your power. But Father, there are those who have come into this place of worship today who are in desperate need of feeling and knowing that you are near. Father, we need you to infiltrate this place. We need to know that we're not just here going through the form and the fashion, that we're not doing what we're doing today just because of a tradition. But Father, we need to know that you are here. And so to everyone under the sound of my voice, it is my plea that you would make yourself vividly known today. Let there be no mistake that they have been today in the presence of Almighty God. Then, Father, not just your presence, but your presence never comes without your power. And so there are some hearts and lives and circumstances and situations, Lord, 
but except for your power will remain unfixed, unhealed, unchecked. So Lord, we need both your presence and your power and we claim it because you promised it where two or three were gathered that you would be in the midst. And so we would end this simple invocative prayer by saying thank you for answering, answering your own decree. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We have walked through three months of this year in three particular calls to the church of God. We walked the first one in January, our call to grow. Um, we know that God is calling us to grow. You can't stay where you are. In this walk of faith, it is, it is dangerous. It is, um, it is fatal in the Christian walk to stand still. We must continue to move forward, move upward, and, and, and to grow. Um, we went through the second month and we talked about the call of the church to recover and restore, particularly those who are missing, those members who used to be a part of fellowship and a part of faith and, and for whatever reason have, 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 have disappeared. And, and we said that it is the responsibility of those that are here to chase uh, as God has chased us. I believe we said we're supposed to chase them uh, not like muggers but like lovers. Um, and God has put that responsibility on, 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 on the shoulders of a people who have decided that they want to be like him. And then we walked last month, the month of March, we walked through the call to nurture. We've talked about those who are new to faith and new to fellowship, that there is a responsibility of the church not to just kind of sit on the sideline and expect that people will mature all by themselves. That that is the responsibility of the church to, to gather around and to nurture them, to make them feel welcome, to engage them. And we walked through that. And this month we've taken to perhaps one of our most... Um, um, important calls. It is the one you see on the screen. It is the call to be what everybody? One, that God has called the people of God. He has called us not to be separate and apart and all over the place. He has called us to be one. Jesus in this uh, prayer in John chapter 17 as he's uh, about to leave, he prays there. He says, I would, Father, that you would take those that you have given to me. And he says, it is my prayer that they should be one even as you and I are, are, are one. And so this month, in the month of, 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 what month is this? April. We're going to be walking through our call to be one. And there are four things, four elements of this call that we're going to be walking through from week to week. And I want to share with you what they are. And these are things that will help us or that need to happen in order for us to answer effectively and honestly the call to be one. Today we're going to spend a little time talking about fellowshipping. What did I say? Fellowshipping. There's no way in the world that we can be one unless we're willing to hang out together. And I'm not talking about just sitting next to somebody in church. We're going to get to that in just a minute and some of those things that inhibit that. But number two, in the second week of the month, we're going to be focusing on, here's another thing that we have to do if we're going to be one. We've got to be uh, protecting is the next word. Number one word is what? Fellowshipping. Number two word is protecting. You know, one of the things that we often fail to do is, 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 is uh, well, we said we went over this in prayer meeting last night. You know, there's a whole lot of people that will join a club, that will join a gang. You join a gang oftentimes because you're scared. And the gang will offer you some protection. And ain't nothing wrong with that. You want to be a part of a fellowship, be a part of a people where you know somebody there has got your and not with a knife in it. You know what I'm saying? And so protecting. We've got to, we're going to take a look through that. And then number three. Ah. So the first word was fellowshipping. The second one was protecting. The third one is forgiving. The people of God will never, ever be one until we learn 
how forgiveness works and how to forgive one another. There will always, there will always be distance between family members, between people, except we understand what forgiving is really about. And then we're going to end the month, end the month talking about following, following, following. So number one, we're starting with fellowshipping. Number two, we're moving to protecting. Number three, we're moving to forgiving. And then finally, following, following. If we're going to be one, if we're going to move together in, in one accord, if the, if, the, if the AY department is going to move together on the same page, everybody, uh, there are some team members that need to know that they are Indians and not chiefs. There got to be some, along with the chef, there's got to be some line cooks. Uh, and, and, and so uh, one of the things that, that, that inhibits unity is, is, is when we don't understand fully how to follow. Gotta, gotta learn how to follow. We spend a lot of time in a lot of places on our jobs in the church. We spend a whole lot of time talking about leadership. We very rarely spend time talking about fellowship. And so we're going to talk about that as we end, end the month. But today I want you to take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of John. John <coughs> chapter 13. John chapter 13. We're talking about fellowship. Um, I wish, I told the folk in prayer meeting, I wish I, I could spend the whole month talking about fellowship. Um, um, we, 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 we need to get a, a kind of raw when it comes to this if we're going to make some progress. What do you mean, Pastor? I shared with my crew, at, can I, I guess we are streaming, but that's all right. Yeah, because it's like that wherever you are too, for those of you that are joining us over the internet. I got this call, I mentioned to the folk in Permian. I got a call before I came to Daughter of Zion. Had not been introduced yet. It was about two months maybe even before I stepped foot in the building. And the individual on the other line of the other side of the phone said, Pastor, we're here. You're coming to DOZ. We're excited for you to come. And in the course of the conversation, the individual said to me, Pastor, you know, it's a good thing. Are, are they ready for this? Are they ready? Okay. All right. Um, they said, it's a good thing that you have one parent who was West Indian and another parent who is American. You know, my daddy is from Trinidad and my mama is from Chicago. And they said, you, 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 you're going to be okay because you're not going to be one who is prone to take a side. Um, And, and I said, Lord, have mercy. Now, to be honest, I wasn't shocked or surprised because we know it, you can go anywhere and this stuff happens. But it ought to shock us. And it ought to surprise us. It ought to make it. And somebody said to me just recently that they overheard some conversation about Jamaicans and Haitians. And, 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 and how there was a rift and, a, and, a, and the fusses and the fights and the stuff that goes on. And, and um, where is Jose? Jose? Jose. They didn't tell me nothing about the Americans and the Puerto Ricans, but I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> There's some of that stuff that goes on, and, 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 uh, and where, where is Brandon? Brandon, where are you at? And, and the white folk. I don't know. We didn't, I didn't hear you know, that kind of stuff that's going on with the Italians and uh, what was the other one? Italian and what? Italians and the Irish going on at DOZ. But <clears throat> so you might not be able to read it, but I want you to read that bottom line with I'm going to say it, and I want you to say it back to me. It says, we are committed. Say it. To demolishing. demolishing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want you to say that like you're really trying to tear something down. We are committed to, to demolishing. Get that guttural thing. To demolishing. Do that. All right. To demolishing. <laughs> Everything that threatens our unity in Christ. <laughs> we are committed to demolishing everything 
that threatens our unity in Christ. We, we good with that? You, you ready? We, we, we got to get to the point where we are literally, really, sincerely committed to demolishing everything that threatens our unity in Christ. And so what I told the prayer meeting crew this last Wednesday night is there are two words that I want to demolish. I don't want to be intentional about demolishing this month. We're going to intentionally practice it this month. Two words, two words. Here are the words. They and them. <laughs> they and them. We got it. We're going we're to be intentional about demolishing those words this month because it's not they and them, it's we and us. If they are doing something wrong over there, then we are doing something wrong over there. If there's something going on with them, then there's something going on with us. So, so, so we got to get rid of the they and the them, and we're going to replace it with the we and the us. All right? Because some of y'all are going to say, well, they, they don't cook like we cook. <laughs> they don't talk like we talk. So we're going to change that to sound as ridiculous as it sounds to we don't cook like we cook. Because there is no they, there's just we. We don't talk like we talk. <laughs> All right. So we're going to focus on that. Focus on that this month. Why? Because we are committed to demolishing everything that threatens our unity in Christ. We learned on prayer meeting, and we're going to talk a little bit about it now. Learned in prayer meeting that there's one thing primary that, that stands in the way of our unity in Christ. We're going to deal with it right now. In the book of John, chapter 13, I want to walk you through this story. Jesus is about to be crucified. He has, uh, at the end of his three and a half years of ministry on this earth, he has gathered, gathered his disciples for one last supper, one last meal up in this upper room. Now, before the feast of the Passover, John, chapter 13 and verse 1, now, before the feast of the Passover when Jesus knew that his hour was come that he should depart out of this world unto the Father having loved his own which were in the world he loved them unto the end and the supper being ended the devil having now put into the heart of Jesus, Judas Iscariot Simon's uh, son to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and, and he was come from God and went to God, he rises from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Simple story as it reads here, but I want to get you into the story and to see this picture. You saw a little bit that we demonstrated with the children's story. So can I get a little closer to you? Uh, so the disciples are under the impression that they know something is different with Jesus now. There's this, Jesus is, he has just had this triumphal entry into Jerusalem. You remember that? He's standing on this mountain. He's overlooking Jerusalem. And, and, and while crowds are thronged and pressed about him, he's looking over this beautiful, 
beautiful city of Jerusalem. And there are people that are thronged about him that go and grab these palm branches. And they are beginning to shout and to sing his praises, shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. It is as if they are welcoming or beckoning his, his divinity or at least his royalty. And they are paying homage to the great nest that he has and while Jesus is experiencing the people and the, he's looking over and instead of saying yeah boy I got this yo this is this is tight they finally recognize the Bible says he begins to weep because he knows what is about to happen and, and so Jesus now, he takes the very closest of his disciples, the 12, and he gathers them together into this special place. He's about to have his farewell dinner with them. And the table is set. The atmosphere is, is a very special atmosphere. And they come into the building, and we're not told why, but for whatever reason, the servant who is normally there to keep the feet of the people clean, listen, so that they don't muddy up the house, is not there. And so here are Jesus' closest boys, his closest followers. They know more about him than any other group on the face of the planet. They identify with him more closely than any other group. And they roll up to the door, and, and, and here is this awkward pause at the threshold of the door. Um, hey, yo, Pete, man. Um, Where's the servants? I, 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 I don't know. Um, well, what, what are we going to do? We, now stop pushing. What, what we, we can't just walk the dirt into the house. Well, somebody's got to wash your feet. Well, yeah, well, okay, here you go, man. Go, I, I man, I ain't wash it. Please. Can you imagine the, the fussing? Make John do it. He's the youngest. And I ain't washing your feet. Your toe jams been all up. I don't know where your feet been, man. And, 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 and this thing. And so, so now among them, there's this stuff that begins welling up and rising. There's somebody. I guarantee you this. If there are people like we're people, just like ordinary folk, there's, some, there's this one brother who's saying, man, I ain't doing it. But in his mind, what he's really thinking is, I ain't doing it. Because you remember that one time back in 1987 when you spoke to me and, no, no, actually, when you looked at me in that tone of voice, I ain't never got over that. <laughs> you didn't say a word, but I heard you loud and clear. And now, and now, really? You got some guts. You that gall. You think I'm going to get down there and watch your foul, funky feet? Please. Now, they might not have said that out loud at first, but I guarantee you, if, if they were like us, the longer they stayed there and debated over it, the more and more stuff started rising to the surface. There's been some long held on to stuff. That the longer you hang, the more and more and more. Well, you remember that time when your grandmama said this about my grandmama? And, well, actually, I don't remember because I wasn't born yet, but I heard. And so, <laughs> and so what did they do? I'm, I'm getting done. I'm done. Uh, send me. I'm, I'm done in, in like three minutes. I'm telling them to do that to hurry me up. So this is what they decided. They decided rather than to submit to becoming a servant, they would walk their dirt 
into the house and sit down in the presence of Jesus. I cannot help but wonder how many of us today walked our dirt into the presence of Jesus because we were too proud to walk up to somebody and say, I'm sorry. we were too selfish to admit I was wrong we would have rather held on to the image that we thought we were projecting and usually we're wrong to maintain some line of, of, of imagined respectability by thinking I didn't mess up. I was right all along. And so we walked some dirt into the presence of Jesus when we came into the house today. What did Jesus do? I love Jesus. Jesus is so awesome. Jesus comes in. We're not told that he was there when the guys come in. He comes in and, and there's a funk in the house. Yeah, you, you guys realize that. Yeah, dirty feet cause for funk in the house. And there's a whole lot of folk on the outside who don't like being in funky places. So that's why they don't come in to the house. Is because we were too knuckleheaded to get the feet clean. So Jesus. <sighs> Jesus comes in without saying a word he takes off the clothes of being the teacher then he puts on the girdle of the servant didn't say a word goes and he grabs the basin and I imagine Jesus is just doing this as if this is just the normal how stuff rolls. Hey, so Peter, man, so how's your mother doing, man? She doing all right? Things are going well? Here, let me get this up. Here, let me, let, me, let me get your feet, man. And he just says, all right, cleans him up. It's all right, all right. He says, uh, so Matthias, man, how's your cousin, man? She doing all right? We had that talk, and he's just... We're good. But here, like, let me pray with you, man. He says, let me pray with you about that. And Jesus just goes from one to the other to the other. He takes that girdle and he rubs off the extra dirt. And when Jesus stands, listen. When Jesus stands up, the mud, the dirt, they're now staining his clothes. The funk is now on his hands. He's saying to you and to me this. If you would lead, you must be willing to serve. If you would follow, you must be willing to be humble. would lead and if you would follow you must be willing to carry the dirt and the funk the stain 
of the people around you if you really want to be like me you must be willing to have your life sullied and dirtied by living in fellowship with people who are dirty around you forgiveness forgiveness never hinges on somebody asking you for forgiveness forgiveness is never hinged on somebody else's apology some of us think I'll forgive them as long as they apologize some of you uh -uh. some of us sitting up in here got all kind of dirt all over us and 2,000 years ago Jesus climbed a hill called Calvary stretched his arms forth opened them wide before you even got dirty before you even knew what an apology was and said I forgive you gonna be like Jesus gotta learn how to forgive like Jesus gotta learn how to serve like Jesus father right now as we were about to separate and just simply go through the symbolism of foot washing Lord you taught us to do this as a as a memorial or, or as a lesson study as a as an object lesson to help us remember that you have called us to follow and that in following it means that we must serve it means that we've got to be willing to get dirty it means that we must be willing to forgive even in the absence of an apology Father, teach us that. Write that thing on our hearts, on our brains, so that it becomes not just the stuff that we preach or the stuff that we sing about or the stuff that we read about. Make it today the stuff that helps make us who we are. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. At this time, I'm going to ask that our deacons will stand and they will lead the men of the congregation and those that will engage in our foot washing today lead us over to our fellowship hall. The ladies, if you will just remain seated for just a moment or begin your transition in following our deaconess over to my right and to your left where the ladies will engage in the foot washing. Those of you that choose not to participate in this, we're asking that you just remain for us in about 20, 25 minutes. We will return and go on with the rest of our service in the ordinances of the bread and the wine.